Yes, everything you've heard about the cat house is absolutely 100% true. Every story, the debauchery, oh my God. Before we begin, I think I need to get you all up to date. Some big changes have been happening around these parts. So give me a minute, then we'll check out the Cat House Hollywood podcast, or better yet, what led to Rock's most notorious nightclub. First question I want to ask you, have you heard episode one of the Cat House Hollywood podcast before? It's quite possible you have, because I've posted this show one, maybe two dozen times, and I keep taking it down, re-editing it, and posting it again. At one point, the Cat House Hollywood podcast had over two dozen episodes. At one point, the Cat House Hollywood podcast had four episodes in the top six at iTunes. Altogether, well over a half a million downloads. I would say this is sort of like an outlaw podcast because I'm doing everything myself. We're not part of any kind of network. We don't have advertisers unless it's my cat house shirts or coffee or something like that. The revenue that I have made in all of the podcasting that I've done is zero. Truth is, I really dig doing these podcasts, but when other jobs come up or something else, go ride my motorcycle or whatever, the incentive isn't always there to spend 18 hours straight doing a podcast when I don't get paid for it. I mean, I do a lot of things that I don't get paid for. That's okay. But I've started a Patreon. So now if you pay $2 a month or $5 a month or however much you pay, I have an incentive because, hey, you're paying 5 bucks a month. I better keep on getting great podcasts out all of the time. I will be posting some for free, but most of them are going to be on my Patreon, which I'll talk about a little bit later. When I went into podcasting, it really was just learn as I go. I I got this mixing board and it sounds a little blurry to me right now or fuzzy and I don't even know how to adjust it, but that's just to show you one thing. Anybody can do a podcast and pretty much everybody does do a podcast, but you can start one yourself just like I am. Since September 11th, 2022, I've been touring. Yes, touring with my one-man show, One Foot in the Gutter. This three-hour storytelling show, yeah, I didn't plan on being on stage for three hours. That's just the way it ended up, and I just didn't know what part to edit out. But to be the tr- to be truthful, OFITG has been so far the crown jewel of my career, and I love doing One Foot in the Gutter. Some of the stories that I used to tell on stage were in podcasts. So that's another reason that I pulled all of the podcasts down. I'm now starting to put more of them up, but I'm going to be editing and they're going to go to the Patreon first. Also, I found out more details on some of the stories that I've told, especially when I was touring. So I'm updating some of those podcasts as well. So I'll be releasing podcasts on my Patreon several like in the first couple months I'm just going to be banging them out and then I'll be putting them out once in a while on your regular podcast platform so basically what I'm here to say is just join my Patreon okay I really want to start the show so join me one more time for episode one of the Cat House Hollywood podcast which tells the story of how one of the biggest rock and roll bands actually paid to play the cat house. Coming to you from the Cat House South Studios in Race City, USA, this is episode one of the Cat House Hollywood Podcast. In 1986, I was a club DJ at some of LA's biggest underground dance clubs. My then roommate, Tammy Down, worked in a clothing store on Melrose called Retail Slut. He was about to play his first show in his new band called Faster Pussycat. With my promoting skills and his popularity in the Hollywood rock scene, which was really just beginning at the time, we decided to open up a rock and roll dance club. In the movie The Metal Years, Tammy says, we opened up the club to get free drinks and to meet strippers. To be honest, that was the motivation. From 1986 to 1992, 
Ricky Rackman's world-famous Cat House became the most notorious rock club in Hollywood. Our house band was Guns N' Roses, and some of the biggest names in rock and roll performed live at the Cat House. But the Cat House was more than just live bands. It was a haven for sleaze and debauchery, raunch and roll. I had a strict no-camera rule, so anything could and did happen at the Cat House. I've never shared these stories until now. I'm Ricky Rackman, and each episode of the Cat House Hollywood podcast will paint the picture of that moment of rock and roll excess. It might be a musician that sold 5 million records or the girl that worked the coat check. It doesn't matter. At the Cat House, we were all rock stars. For episode one, we go back to February 6th, 1990. You'll hear the tale about the only band to ever pay to play the Cat House. That year, they went from obscurity to become one of the biggest rock and roll bands of 1990. The Cat House Hollywood Podcast will return right after this. Do you love coffee? I mean, really love coffee? Do you know what specialty coffee is? It's a coffee that scores above 80 points on a 100-point scale. Specialty coffee is grown at high altitudes with care and attention from local farmers. There is a specialty coffee with a name you already know. Introducing Cat House Coffee. I'm Lea Vendetta, CEO of Cat House Coffee. Ricky and I are there every step of the way. We roast in small batches, so when you get a bag of Cat House Coffee, you know it's fresh, 100% Arabica dark roast. Cat House Coffee, your new favorite coffee. Order at cathousecoffee.com. February 6th, 1990. George Bush was the president. Goodfellas was topping the box office. And a killer Clive Barker movie, Nightbreed, was just released. Ice Ice Baby became the first rap song to reach number one. Yeah, the first number one rap song was a white guy. All the cool people were watching Twin Peaks. Gas was about a buck fifteen a gallon. The Simpsons had just aired the first episode. When you think of some of the great classic hard rock heavy metal records, you of course think the 80s. But the fact is, in 1990, there were some awesome albums released. For instance, Megadeth, Rust in Peace, Alice in Chains, Facelift, Cinderella, Heartbreak Station, Slayer, Seasons in the Abyss, and the album I Never Stopped Playing in 1990, Lights, Camera, Revolution by Suicidal Tendencies. In 1990, Judas Priest was involved in a multi-million dollar lawsuit involving two Nevada teenagers who killed themselves and it was allegedly caused by the song Better By You, Better Than Me. The band won the case. 1990 was two years before the first website. I had been the host of MTV's Headbangers Ball for about a month. The Cat House had been open for four years. Around the LA club scene, there was a policy that the other promoters used called pay to play basically if you were a promoter and you were putting on a show you would get the opening bands to buy tickets in advance it didn't even matter what you sounded like so let's say you wanted to play with guns and roses at the roxy you were the opening band you had to buy a hundred tickets at about 20 bucks a pop that's about two thousand bucks it didn't matter how good you were if you had the money to buy the tickets in advance you'd be on that show what that did was guarantee the promoters would break even before the doors even opened. It also meant if you were a really good band but you didn't have much money, you were pretty much fucked. Cat House never used a pay-to-play policy, except for one instance. I remember reading an article that said that I ran the Cat House with a Don Corleone attitude, meaning that if you were a band and you wanted to play the club, you had to go through me. That's pretty much the case. But that guaranteed that we didn't have any shitty bands on the Cat House stage. It became almost like a feather in the cap to play the Cat House. Sort of like what the Apollo was during the Motown era. I remember one day getting a phone call in my office from Pete Angelus. Pete Angelus was a video director and a manager, having worked with David Lee Roth, and he was currently working with record label mogul and producer Rick Rubin. Pete told me about this new band he was working with from Atlanta and asked if I could give them a slot at the Cat House. I told him, send me a tape. And do you think we could get David Lee Roth to play a show at the club? He said, I'll see what I can do. And he sent the tape. I listened to it. 
And surprisingly, it was really good. It had a real 70s vibe to it, sort of reminiscent of Rod Stewart and Faces. Pete called me back, told me that he'd give me 400 bucks if I gave him a guest list, and he'd put the band on early. I said, okay, but do you think he could get me Dave Lee Roth? Again, Pete said, I'll see what I can do. Uh, we got a phone call from our record company in December telling us that we were going to be taking a brand new band out on the road with us. It was by the request of Rick Rubin. Patrick Mazingo is the drummer of the band Junkyard. They came from East Hollywood. They had a couple hit records on Geffen. Songs like Blues, Hands Off, Simple Man, and Hollywood that got played on MTV. Junkyard, like a lot of the bands from that Cat House era, had their roots in punk rock. Pat played in the band Decry, and their guitarist Brian Baker, who is currently in Bad Religion, played in Minor Threat. Pat recalled the night that he and Brian went to the Cat House. We get word that this band that we're going out with is playing the Cat House, and that date is actually February 6, 1990. We heard the band's name, and we all kind of looked at each other, and we're like, wait a minute, we're taking a speed metal or a death metal band out with us? Just because of the band's name. And the name of that band was the Black Crows. There was a bunch of guys walking around the crowd that, you know, looked the part of uh, probably, I would say, definitely Faces vibe. So the band takes the stage and they kick off the set and we kind of look at each other and we're like, holy crap, uh, this band is actually really good. And afterwards we, you know, kind of chatted with the guys in... uh, I was really excited because I was like, wow, we're going out on the road with this band and every night we get to have a good band open up for us. So two weeks into the tour, they get a little bigger. Um, Three weeks into the tour, they're even bigger. By the end of the tour, well, they should have definitely been headlining because everybody was really coming to see them. Looking back on it, it was a blast, you know, seeing this band, uh, you know, really blow up in front of our faces. Cat House was there to kick it all off have to go back to saying like the first time we heard the band's name, the black crows we were and not hearing a single note or a single song or seeing a picture. We just figured great death metal band. Yeah. Boy, were we wrong. I remember the night the black crows played the cat house. I showed up early because my security guards had a dilemma. They didn't know how to get a 500 pound Hammond C3 organ up onto our tiny stage. Big shocker, no band had ever played the Cat House with a big vintage organ. So let's get this straight. The Black Crows pay to play the Cat House. The following week from their performance, they release their album, Shake Your Money Maker. Then they do a little tour, opening up for Junkyard. Release the single Jealous Again. That song goes to number five, followed by Hard to Handle, which goes to number one. Just a few months after playing at the Cat House, the Black Crows became one of the biggest selling rock bands of 1990, with that album selling over 5 million copies. And for the record, David Lee Roth never did end up playing the Cat House, but he did hang out at Bordello. That was the original episode one of the Cat House Hollywood podcast, and I'll keep this one up for everyone to enjoy, but I've got a whole lot more to put up, and believe me, new Cat House Hollywood podcast as well. Get all of them and so much more by joining my Patreon. We're even going to have Headbangers Ball videos and Cat House videos, stuff for my tour and new content and a lot of brand new old content. I did a show called The Ball. I'm going to be posting that on my Patreon. I've got interviews right now with, oh my God, I did an interview with my mom. So uh, it, it's really cool. And I hope you like the, com- the community that we built there. So just go to patreon.com slash Ricky Rackman. And I want to thank some of those people right now, like Josh Tiarina, Shelby Benson, Missy Alley, Angela McCabe, Adeline Rose, The Maz. Uh, Adeline, The Maz, so thankful to have you as supporters. Uh, Jill Eckhart, Lee Jolke, I hope I'm not pronouncing it wrong. Dwayne Loven, big time Rack Pack, been such a great supporter. Jennifer Schneider Coleman, Don Graham, Catherine Blanco, Barnaby Mortensen, who has the record, I believe, of going to more OFITG shows than anybody else. It could be tied with uh, Mark Montez. I think he went to eight or something like that. 
Stephanie Rogue, Mike Janice Head, great supporter, love you Janice, Jody, Jodis Maximus, and there you go. Those are some of the Patreons that have been supporting the Cat House Hollywood podcast, and uh, there's going to be a lot more to come. I'm Ricky Rackman. Remember to keep one foot in the gutter, one fist in the gold.